Welcome to another episode of Diff Tool Them All. This is the series where we take popular websites and backends and use Dev Tools, Chrome Dev Tools, to see the request that the uh, front end makes to the backend and a little bit get more understanding of how the backend is built and how the front end sends these requests and why is it built. In, a, in this particular manner. It gives us a little bit more insights uh, to uh, to understand the backend architecture and uh, we get to learn more and this is why I have this channel. I want to learn a new thing every day effectively about these, uh, you know, these big companies who build these software and they learn lessons, right? They make decisions every day. So we did one for YouTube, Twitch, uh, Netflix, Apple, and uh, I'm, I was surprised that we didn't have Twitter. So here's what I'm gonna do. So. Uh, I am in incognito mode. I have my VPN enabled so because I don't want Twitter to give me insights or have some prior hint of where I am. So I just enabled the VPN in case and uh, I disabled all the caching. So in case any, uh, I, I d don't want anything to be cached. I want just a fresh first visit. And I also disabled the service workers so that uh, I get the network calls immediately directly. I don't want things to be hidden behind service worker caches. With that said, let's go to my profile. I'm not logged in, obviously, so Twitter won't serve me any cookies. And as a result, they won't get any cookies. As a result, they don't want who I am. So I'm going to go ahead and go to twitter.com HNASR and hit enter and look at the fleet of requests. That's a lot of stuff because there's a lot of images, right? I'm going to pause the recording because uh, Twitter will keep sending more and more requests as a, as a result. Uh, probably for tracking and fingerprinting results. But let's take a look at, at the beginning. So the first request was made to fetch the HTML page, obviously. They are using the HTTP2 protocol, so they can open as many streams as they want to send these requests. But let's take a look. The first domain that they visit twitter.com, that's the side. And let's take a look at the at the waterfall here. So in all stalling at all, we got 22 milliseconds, the DNS lookup, prob probably cached, right? And we have the 85 millisecond, the whole connection that includes the TLS as well. So 63 millisecond off of that TLS, uh, uh, that uh, connection is actually TLS, which is almost like 75%, if, if not more. So let's take a look. What kind of TLS they are using here? They're using TLS 1.3. So I was really, I really thought it was going to be faster <laughs> because TLS 1.3 is just literally one round trip. This tells me that the, most of the time was spent delivering TLS client hello and then to see TLS, obviously, the re response. Yeah, it's quite a lot. You know, that means like 25, almost like 20 milliseconds, just the TCP handshake and the rest is that. Why do I know it's TCP? Because uh, it's HTTP too. So it has to be TCP, obviously. And waiting for the first byte took its 88 millisecond to get the response and 80 millisecond to download a 31 kilobyte that has absolutely nothing. It has this. That's it. Uh, this is... This just, I think this is just a legacy at this point. You know, if I would do this, uh, that I was you, I would use that request to deliver as much information as possible. Uh, this page is absolutely useless, right? That's why you turn around from that response and you start downloading all these JavaScript files, and you're gonna see there are a lot of JavaScript files, a lot of resources, a lot of images. There's most of the images are probably mine. But now you can see that the first request was made to abs.twitterimage.com. So this is their uh, images. So it lives in another domain. So we have to do another TCP connection, another TLS, and obviously download the content. And then once we have opened these two connections, we have uh, this connection, 95, and then 21 connection. Then we use the same connection for everything else. Yeah, so we start using the same connection to send all these requests. And I'm not going to go through all of these. It's all JavaScript file. And this is uh, this is one of the kind of pet peeve, if you will. Uh, it's like, why do we need all these JavaScript files, you know? And I, 
I kind of understand because Twitter has been there for a long time. And if you are a big company that been for a long time, then 2009, was it? It's like I created my account in 2010, right? So it'd be there for a long time. So there is a lot of legacy code. Uh, if you if you give if you give a, a privacy media this website, they he will have write the whole thing in a single JavaScript file and a single HTML and make it way much more better front end. This is atrocious, you know, all these JavaScript files is just absolutely not required, in my opinion, to serve this page. And, and I think most front end engineers would agree with me on this one. You know, it's just you don't need this many JavaScript files, regardless, right? So that uh, the whole thing, obviously, once we get all of this stuff, what I'm interested in is the queries to retrieve my profile information, my followers, my tweets. And this is what I'm interested in. So I'm going to keep scrolling until I find that call, right? And I want you to pay attention to how it looks like here. Here it is. It's the first call that provided useful information user by screen name and i want to pay attention to the url here what do you see https twitter.com api graphql and there's obviously some sort of a token i believe this is a one-time generated thing maybe or maybe maybe not and this is then the the screen variable so this is graphql so the twitter backend is graphql i did not know that Maybe this is a recent upgrade. Well, this is definitely they are on top of GraphQL. And this is what they sent. They sent a bunch of variables. And here's another thing that I, I was surprised. Get. Like that last time I checked, I don't I don't use GraphQL as much, but I made a course on it. GraphQL always supports post. You have to send a post, not get, right? Because the the URL can get so large and get only can put information in the in the URL. So that it's always, you have to always send a post as far as I know, right? So they, that tells me this is a wrapper that Twitter created that hides the actual GraphQL endpoint. But again, it might be just me. So if you, if you notice, this is like, this is a pretty much decoded because there are curly braces and you're going to see that this is actually a JSON. And uh, I like that, uh, uh, DevTool has actually a, an, an built in encoder and decoder. That's pretty cool. That shows you, okay, this is what you send. This is what you send to GraphQL so, to tell us, okay, I want the screen name. This is the parameter, query parameter. I don't want this information back effectively. Yeah? So GraphQL obviously will return. This is the information that will return. It says, okay, data, user, result. There is a lot here, you know, so you're going to see a lot of legacy here just because of legacy reasons, you know, entities. They have a fair. Here's my favorite count. How many posts I like, I believe. Followers count uh, 14,000. I did not know that I had 14,000. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I thought I, last time I checked it was like 9,000. Right. Uh, friends count. Look at that. Um, where am I located? California, my name, normal. What is that? Normal follower count. So there is a lot of content here that you GraphQL. The purpose of GraphQL is to allow the unlike rest, allow the front end to specify exactly what it needs. And instead of building a kind of a hard coded rest endpoint that does a, a single specific query. That being said, you can obviously override rest to stick parameters but it's not as flexible as GraphQL. That being said, GraphQL is not easy to implement by any stretch of the imagination, obviously. So it has a lot, a lot of leaky abstractions and can get thrown. And we're going to see the cost of GraphQL in a minute. <laughs> right, so we're going to continue here. So instead of going through all of them, what I'm going to do is actually filter the GraphQL ones, right? And just like that, because this was the screen name. And this is another call that kind of gives the kind of similar information. So you're going to see a lot of duplicates here. It's like that's kind of identical to what the first query was, you know, it's like, hey, give me that. But it's uh, the rest version. Yeah. Then there is a Twitter articles slice. There is so there is a, you know, how Twitter have a bunch of on the list. It's, this is the what's happening, the articles. This is how what it retrieves it. We can see how cheap it was. 70 millisecond but look at this user tweets how big is this 
took 930 milliseconds to retrieve 19 kilobytes, right? So almost a second to execute that query through GraphQL. So this kind of gives us information about whether this hit the cache or not. I don't think it did, right? It w probably went to the database directly. My guess is because I forced a, an empty cache. I went, disabled the cache, so nothing about my information was sent at all. No cookies at all. So it treated this as a brand new query that punched through the cache. Okay, that was... I will be surprised if this is actually a cached query because that's so slow. You know, 920 to retrieve how many? How many? 40 Twitter. So that's another benefit of the GraphQL. You send that and says, okay, I want for this user ID, give me all their tweets. And I want 40 of them. And then please include promoted content. Please with quick promoted uh, this, include with super follows, include this information, you know? So all of this voice notes, if you have a voice note, please include them. Uh, include the V version two timeline. All of this, you know, you can tell so much about the backend by just looking at what the front end is requesting. And the cool thing about it is just say, hey, you can just copy this thing as fetch and clear this thing. You can do the paste, then add or JSON. You can just do that. Boom. What what did I do? Oh, forgot. Sorry. <laughs> Missed the A dot JSON. So this is just basically sending the same query and you can get the information. Right? So you can send that. You can send it through curl if you want. But uh I cannot send this query through any other website because of course, because there is a strict uh, uh policy, you know. Uh, uh, request a cross origin policy here. I believe that whatever we got here is kind of limited, you see, because um, that is generated based on the session that I just created. So if you took that URL and started using it, it will expire after a while. I don't think Twitter will allow you to use that as all, all the time, right? But look at that, that is really expensive. So I really want to know, it's like, what is the actual query being executed? And they could do better, definitely. 19 kilobytes or it's 40 tweets. You know, this, there are no images or anything like that. But the, I believe the legacy that is happening here, there's so much. You know, let's go through this. Actually, I'm showing you a timeline here. If you go to those instructions, and there is a response object. So these are the feedback actions to the tweet properly. Instructions. And then uh, you'll notice that there's timeline clear cache, timeline add entries, timeline pin entries. So these are kind of a commands that the backend sends back to the front end to update its cache. And obviously clear cache is zero, but then it says, hey, here, add all these entries and all of the, here, all my tweets. So if you go there, you click on the content, go to the item content, right? Tweet results, result. There's legacy, here's what I found it. And this is my, that my latest show, basically, the mutual TLS, I talked about it, check it out. So mutual TLS. So, and it tells you, okay, it was retweeted once. Uh, it was favorited 17 times. But for the fronted that is actually Twitter, again, if uh, if a good fronted engineer, I'm not a good fronted engineer at all. So they, they can build a very compact Twitter. You can actually do that, you know, and use the same API and get way better, more performance than actual Twitter website. Because, like, they return stuff that it's not ever even shown on the front end, you know? Again, it's like, Traverse Media can crack this in a, in a day or an hour or two. But look at that, you know? So all of this stuff, a lot, that is a lot of information. But all of these, this is all, all my tweets. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to clear this. So one, so one final thing I want to do is I want to go to one of my, you know, kind of a popular tweet that I asked the other day. And it says, in your opinion, what makes software complex? And this is a really a good question, right? And uh, great comments, by the way. So what I'm going to do is I click on that tweet. And I'm going to, again, only interested in the tweet details and the user ID. Right? So if I click on the tweet details here, and again, I have GraphQL filtered here. And uh, you notice that I'm going to have all the instruction. How big was that payload? 
it was around 19 K and it took again. Notice that any queries that has to do with tweets are always the slowest. It's around 600 milliseconds, you know? Uh, and obviously Twitter is like have billions of tweets. So that kind of makes sense, right? Uh, can you optimize that a little bit more? Of course, everything can happen, you know? You can do any of this stuff. But it's just fascinating to look at how real slow that can get. And in a few more years, will that get worse or will it get better? That's another question, right? So now, if I go to... Here's something I couldn't explain. There's a bunch of errors that are returned, denied by access control. So there's... Because I don't have access... I got errors, but why? It's really, you shouldn't really return the errors to, I, I know that I'm not authenticated. Just tell me once that I'm not authenticated, not what, 27 times. So that's, that was a little odd, you know, but regardless, you can see the instructions here. Okay, go and add information here. You can see the tweets. I'm going to go to, so the first one has to be my tweet, but look at all these structured, you know, and because of, I believe that GraphQL is asked to bring version two, which ha now we have this complex representation, which is very convoluted. Like, there is so much stuff. Neoprenium, what makes software complex, obviously. You, this is my tweet. And the second one is the conversation. And you can see that these are all the items. So if I go, I want to see the person who replied first. Who are you, my friend? There you go. Lack of planning and the ability to throw away a prototype to start over. That's true. I agree. I totally agree. And uh, I want to know who was this guy. It doesn't say. So you have to go to a another entry. You know? Entities. Entities actually just show me the mention. But if you go to core you see the actual user who said that. So you can see that there is, this could be simplified a lot, obviously. Um, obviously, this is Firas Adahlawi from Seattle, Washington. How do you know? How do I know Seattle, Washington? This is, I would say, this is in Arabic, Seattle, Washington. And, and this is all this information. So it's pretty cool. Oh, he works at Google. Pretty neat. So yeah, guys, I want to leave it at that today. Uh, it's pretty cool. I, I like I like this back end. Uh, uh, the front end can get a little bit better, I believe, in my opinion. Uh, there is so much JavaScript unnecessarily. Again, you might say, oh, we have to have a lot of JavaScript because of this and this and this and this and this. But yeah, we have to break that a little bit. You know, it's just... Uh, all of this is just bloat at the end of the day, you know, can be simplified. But images like this, obviously, not much you can do about that. But uh, the front, the back end GraphQL, I, again, I made a video about GraphQL. I gave my opinion on that. Uh, sometimes GraphQL is simplifies thing from development purpose. I can't talk. Sometimes GraphQL simplifies things and from deployment point of view, but encourages bad queries why because you have to write these connectors right to to do an actual query graphql won't do it for free for you and if you rely on things to be abstract then the queries won't be written in as an efficient manner you won't know what indexes to use you don't want to know what indexes has most selectivity right you will have a bad habit of iterating and executing the same query over and over again and instead paying the cost of networking between the backend and the database and instead of actually sending a single query that does everything on the database i've seen it with the n plus one problem with graphql so that's why i always always prefer again this is a preference I like to write my queries raw because I understand exactly what I sent and I, you know, I optimize every query I write as a result. I know every query. Hope you enjoyed this episode. What do you think about Twitter, uh, front end and back end? Let me know in the comment section below. I'm going to see you in the next one.
You guys stay awesome.